This Veterans History Project interview is being conducted on Monday, August 21st in the year 2006 here at the Niles Public Library in Niles, Illinois. My name is Neil O'Shea and I'm speaking with Mr. Robert Goldberg. Uh, Mr. Goldberg was born on August 10th, uh, 1930 and uh, now lives in Glenview. He has uh, kindly consented to be interviewed for this project. Uh, Mr. Goldberg served in the United States Army uh, during the time of the uh, Korean conflict and uh, we're very grateful for his uh, deciding to come in and to share his story with us uh, and it's uh, from our brief discussions it sounds very interesting. Um, so let's begin then. Um, Mr. Goldberg, uh, how did you come to enter the United States uh, Army? Were you it's an interesting question because I was at the point of graduating with my advanced master's degree and I wanted to be available when I got out of the Army for employment. So instead of waiting for the draft to be called, uh, I went to the draft board and requested that my number be moved to an appropriate time so that my discharge would coincide with uh, employment where it was in the educational system and uh, I would be working uh, in September. So I was looking to get in and get out sometime in July and I was drafted. I had previously requested entry into uh, the Coast Guard officers program but um, I was turned down because of lack of funds to have the number of officers that they had previously had. When I was drafted and went through my basic training, I received a letter uh, in my barracks uh, with the United States Army uniform on my back uh, saying that funds now are available <laughs> and they are ready and willing to take me into the Coast Guard uh, training program in New London, Connecticut. Because I was now engaged, I said no thank you and kept my appointment to the U.S. Army. May I ask where you were attending school at that time or uh, college? I was uh, getting my degree from the University of Illinois in uh, science and uh, uh, biological studies. And so you are mentioned the timing of your service so you were able to go you were able to enter then in July of 53 and you were able to come out then in July of 55. That's correct. And that was going to be helpful as far as planning. Yes, and, yes. Putting your degree to work. Um, um, you mentioned without there wouldn't have been any question then of your being drafted. You would have been drafted. Uh, there was always a question but it was uh, minimally uh, possible that I would not because everybody was being drafted. The Korean conflict was still there. This was before the, uh, the arrangement to stop fighting. So uh, I knew that there was very little chance of not being drafted and I decided to be in control. Were you living in Chicago at that time or Champaign or? I was living in Champaign uh, at the time of finishing my master's degree. And you're working on that full time? <clears throat> I was full time. And then, so were you able to complete your master's then before you entered or? I was. You were. I was. Yeah. Which was beneficial and now that I think back, of course. So how long did you have to defer entering into the Army to complete the degree? Uh, My degree was completed. I was drafted as a master's degree recipient. So you'd have, you'd have had your master's anyway before you went into the Army? I would have. Yeah. Okay. I hopefully I would have. Yeah. And um, so you didn't have a choice on branch of service then, or, or did you? No, I had no choice at all. I was drafted into the U.S. Army Infantry, and was told that I was going to be sent to wherever there was a need for the infantry. Where was your induction? Was that in? Uh, that was in. Um, Camp Crowder, Missouri, which is no longer. 
And then I went from Camp Crowder to Fort Riley. Now, you would, I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of the other um, enlistees or people who were, you found yourself in service with weren't necessarily uh, already completed their college education and had master's degrees? I was probably 5% of the people in the area of um, basic training that had that kind of education. So was basic training interesting? A lot of different people there from oh, my all walks yes. of life? And my yes. Well, growing up in Chicago, uh, on the west side of Chicago, and uh, also growing up in a rather liberal university, uh, I was pretty well indoctrinated with uh, a variety of folks. And uh, because of that, it wasn't shocking to be in a barracks with uh, people that, uh, that didn't have all of these social graces uh, that I experienced in college because in my neighborhood we had people that just unfortunately were like that. And a lot of immigrants uh, that were still learning, but uh, I was not shocked. Nothing you couldn't cope with or no me Nothing yeah. I couldn't cope with. and. Uh, I really probably benefited from that some way. So after boot camp, does the Army decide they're going to make use of your special special training and background? Um, well, it's, it's a great question because I just don't know. <laughs> um, I, I, um, I experienced a variety of, of jobs uh, before I really got into where I finalized. Um, I learned right off very first two days that if during the uh, pre-basic training time, if you were able to find a broom and carry the broom wherever you went, you probably didn't have to do some of the work that was offered if you didn't carry a broom. Uh, people would look at me and say, I've already got a job, but I was, my job was carry the broom. And the big thing was to hide the broom so that nobody would take it while I was eating or sleeping. But uh, before I went to my final uh, duty station, I was a bus driver, uh, which was during the time of uh, my security clearance, which took uh, up to about 10 days. So I was uh, finally cleared for secret in my job, which later on in the interview we might be able to get to. Right. So you're, you're, are you still down in Camp Crowder? I was at Camp Crowder until they decided what infantry I was going to go to, I suppose, and then I was just told, here is a, a train ticket and you're going from Missouri to Kansas. And here is how you're going to get there. And I got there. And when I got there, I was in the uh, infantry. I think it was the first infantry division. I don't remember uh, where because it's a blur. Um, all I remember is that uh, Kansas is very dusty and very hot. And it has a very flat terrain except for a large hill that we were asked to go up and down a few times a day, seven days a week. Did you find that you, uh, did you put on weight when you were in the, in the military, put on, lose weight, or did it change yeah. your appearance, or? No, I don't think I lost weight uh, mm -hmm. tremendously because they did feed you uh, stuff that would stick to your ribs. Um, I, I think I maintained my uh, my weight and my health. I never got sick, um, and my appetite was always good. So you're in. You're with the first uh, infantry division. Infantry division in Kansas. I'm not sure if I was in that division in Kansas. I was in it in yes in Kansas. I'm not sure about about in Missouri. Right. So we go from Missouri to Kansas. Kansas. And this is still relatively early days, right? I mean, this is still within three or four months of your yeah, going. Yes. 
But then you're going to be you're going to go somewhere from Kansas too, right? From Kansas, I was given a piece of paper that said I am now going to be offered a few days of uh, freedom in my home uh, in Illinois, and I was to make my way down to uh, the Army Chemical Center in Edgewood, Maryland. After your after, after I yeah, did. Whatever, we, were, yeah. we were taken from Missouri to Kansas. We were taken by train altogether. I was taken by train altogether from Illinois to Missouri, Camp Crowder. And uh, I was supposed to get to uh, the uh, Army Chemical Center in Maryland on my own with the order, uh, which was a couple of sheets of paper in an envelope that said to be delivered to X on Y. So at this point, are you, you, are you thinking, I might be sent over to Korea, I may not be sent over to Korea, and maybe your family is wondering, and then you, now, you're, now all of a sudden you're going south. All of that was erased as soon as I was given the paper that said go to Edgewood, Maryland. Prior to that, every day we were told, you're going to somewhere over the ocean. Now, they didn't say which way, but every day they said, you're going into combat or somewhere else. So that was an important piece of paper for you yes. and your family, right? That was a very important piece for me. And you knew that that was a chemical... Um, I knew it was the Army Chemical Center. So you had to figure by this time they're going to realize what a valuable employee they have in your person and... Uh, I would think at that time I thought, yeah, they recognized my skill, which I never knew I had. <laughs> but they did. So you get to... Um, I was a rookie all the way down the line. I was a rookie right out of college and I had never done anything in my industry which was going to be education. I had graduated um, and now I was going to go somewhere where they valued me. Yeah, but you did have a, you mentioned you were getting an advanced degree. In, I had it. In, at that in point. chemistry or in science? In biological, biological studies. Biological studies. So, I'm just curious, did the, the, did the Army, like they analyze people's transcripts or they give them tests or how do they make the decision that they've got you know they got thousands upon thousands of people coming in and you got to put each person in the best slot I would imagine. My feeling is yes. it's a dartboard. Mm. My feeling is it's a crapshoot because a very good friend of mine who's an architect did get sent into the the engineering corps when he was sent to Korea and he said he never did anything with his architecture mm. background although he was in the Corps of Engineers. Mm. And what he did... Uh, At least he got that, they got that right. <laughs> they got that right, yeah. But he was there. So you get to, you get to, uh, to Maryland there. I got to Maryland. And you're going to be in Maryland now for how long? Uh, well, as far as my, I was concerned, at that moment, I was going to be in Maryland for the rest of my two years, which would have been, at that point, one year and probably nine or eight months. Uh, but before I could do anything, they needed to make sure that I was not a, uh, a spy. Mm. And so they needed to clear me for a certain level of uh, involvement with things I was going to work with, and that was to be cleared for secret. Now, I wasn't cleared for top secret, which made me very, very saddened, but I was cleared for secret, and before I was able to do that, time was going to lapse. Yeah. lapse. And they taught me how to drive a bus. So I drove a bus for two weeks, uh, the, close to two weeks, and drove the ladies' army basketball team to and from their games. I didn't know they had a ladies' army basketball team. It was team called, yeah, the Wax, the w Wax. Wax. And um, when I wasn't driving the ladies, uh, I was driving the post bus, getting people from A to B to C to D and then back again to A if they wanted to, uh, on one of these big uh, buses with uh, the air brakes and air, you know, I, that was very important. Important jobs, yeah. Yeah. So after 10 days then, did they, I wonder how they did the security check, did they? 
talk to high school uh, teachers they, or your I family? I understand or they did. I understand yeah. they did talk to my family. What they asked them, I'll never know. Um, and they may have talked to friends, and because I only listed people who are going to give me very course, good references, yeah, yeah. it's dumb if you don't. Uh, and I did. Um, and then I was cleared for secret. And what happened, uh, now is I guess a good time as any to tell the story about uh, our officers, and we also had civilians. There were two uh, groups in the M Army Chemical Corps. We had the Army level, which was, of course, administered through the Army itself. And then we had the civilians who worked as researchers. And so the head of my department was, in fact, a civilian. Uh, he, in turn, would answer to the head of the uh, group of army that we were involved with, who was a, uh, a, a colonel. And he, in turn, would answer to a low-level general that was involved with ours. But we were told, on almost a daily basis, not to leave anything on our desk at night. Everything that we were going to write on and throw away, we were to shred. And the shredding in those years was tearing up. We didn't have a shredder. Um, we were to shred. And all of our uh, drawers where we would keep our equipment or notes of work that we were doing, and we can get into this later, uh, we were to make sure it was secure. And we did. We were not to write to our families and tell them anything about what we were doing. Where we were was not a problem because the name of the place was Chemical Center and research stuff, but not to say anything about it. And we all were pretty good at it. We, uh, we didn't do it until one morning we got up and we went down to our uh, day room, and there we found the current magazine, the current week of Look magazine. And the headline in Look magazine was, look what's going on in the Army Chemical Center. Basically, that's paraphrased. And we took a look inside, and there were our laboratories, and there were our things that we were going on with nerve gas, which I can now say, and the way the Army is researching. Nothing technical and nothing of secret nature, but at least there it was. Our cover was blown. And we didn't know whether or not to take that magazine and stamp it secret, <laughs> where we were told to stamp everything that we did. And so there lies the uh, competency of our government and its security. Look Magazine blew my cover. So I was cleared for secret, and I went into the laboratories. And in the laboratories, I was responsible not for the chemical part, which was the actual manufacturing of nerve gas, which was organic phosphate poison, which today we know of as nerve gas, and is peroxone and parathione, which I can say, uh, had been researched early on in the 1920s, I do believe, as an insecticide for farmers. And uh, we also were testing the uh, way atropine would be an antidote. Uh, the chemists were involved with doing the actual manufacturing with the chemistry, and we in the biological area were responsible for finding how this stuff worked on the body. Not being able to work on our own bodies, we were working on other mammals, and uh, we were responsible for trying to establish an LD50. An LD50? LD50. What is that? Right, my next question. Please, what is an LD50? LD50 is short for lethal 
dose 50 percent. So what our government wanted to know is if you took a dose of this nerve gas, <clears throat> which was highly toxic, and by the way, uh, it's not a gas. Uh, nerve gas is really a liquid that is highly volatile. And when exposed to air, will evaporate into the air as tiny droplets is how it's to be distributed, tiny droplets. And the droplets will evaporate, get into the air, or get on your skin. And you are absorbing it through the wet parts of your body, which would be the mouth, uh, the eyes, and any open sores. Uh, skin itself will absorb it through the pores, but not as readily as through the, the moist tissues. And, and so we were to take this highly toxic material, mix it with a substance that it could mix with, a substrate, and uh, that substrate was peanut oil. And then we would take this small amount, which was measured in micron, and uh, inject it into a variety of, of mammals and see at what level we could cause 50% lethal. In so the mammals? We, in the mammals. So we take 20 mice and inject them, and when 10 died, we knew that's the lethal dose 50, LD50 for the mouse. We then would try it on a goat, and we try it on a rat, and we went up as high as, um, as a pig and a monkey. We didn't do monkeys too much because they were very expensive, and we just wanted to test different uh, body functions with, uh, with the monkeys. Were you, um, you were accustomed to working with lab animals, were you, because of your college studies? You were used to working with? Minimally. Minimally. My work in college was, was a hamster. Frog, maybe? Or... Uh, well, a frog's not a mammal, That's but right. a frog. A frog uh, and a, uh, is not a mammal, so we didn't work on frogs. We worked on hamsters and mice and rats, which were cheap, easily available, easily reproduced, and uh, moved on once we found the LD50 for that, tried to use a finagle factor of some sort to project uh, weight right. toward uh, a rat to a goat. So how big is the goat? Uh, interestingly enough, the pig was uh, most highly resistant to this uh, nerve gas. Why? Intelligence, is it? No. No, no you, you don't have to be smart to uh, be resistant to the gas. Your the pig body was more resistant than just about any other body. Because of the fat, eat. the layer of fat or whatever? Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> None of you... you um, formerly civilian researchers or whatever, you weren't, uh, there was no queasiness about being involved in this project, working on something that would be a kind of a Well, first of all, weapon. we didn't have a choice. We didn't have a choice. We didn't, we'd have a choice. Uh, they didn't ask us, would you like to or would you not <laughs> like to? Yeah. Uh, they said, you will, is how everything is prefaced. You will, at this point. And, um, and we just did. Mm -hmm. um, we were, we were sort of elite in that uh, we knew that we had skills and we really didn't have to get our, uh, our uh, fingernails muddy too mm -hmm. often, although we were uh, responsible for handling this stuff and had to wear monitoring devices and had to uh, spend a couple of uh, days a month in staffing the dispensary where the stuff was really manufactured uh, chemically. So were you able to, to hit upon the, the LD50 level for human beings then? Well, we anticipated and projected. Uh, even though I might have liked to, on some of our officers, make a, uh, an experiment, we um, we did have a pretty good handle uh, based on our work with the goat and the monkey as to what the LD50 would be. 
uh, in a particular uh, dose of, uh, of, of the stuff. Your officers, were they some of them hard to get along with? No, the officers were easy to get along with because we didn't take anything from them. Uh, they were regular army, we were, in, we, we were not. Um, and so their biggest problem was trying to get us to play soldier the way they were taught to play soldier. Salute and yes sir. And, and yeah. all that. Yeah. Um, we did cooperate with them uh, and uh, had no trouble in, uh, in getting along. Uh, the only trouble might be uh, uh, getting some of us out of bed in the morning to do that uh, that reveille and uh, uh, the end of the day sort of stuff. But for the most part, we all got along. They they knew what they had to do. We knew what we had to do. They recognized. We recognized, and uh, the place ran pretty well. So finding that LD-50 level, that, that occupied most of your time in Maryland then, did it? That occupied all of my time all in Maryland, time. with the exception of the uh, experiment that we developed because of ancillary effects that one could get not being able to put a gas mask on in time with gas as a gas. And the only thing that a gas mask would do, if it was the right kind of gas mask, uh, to filter out nerve gas would be to inhale it into the lung. A uh, gas mask couldn't, and, and, and if it was a, a good mask, and not just over your mouth, and up over the eyes, which most of them were, then it would protect the eyes, which is a, a moist uh, tissue, and the mouth. It wouldn't, it would not, uh, protect your, your ears, it wouldn't protect any open sores, it wouldn't protect your uh, skin where the gas could enter through the, or the, this liquid, could enter through the pores. But we knew that there was a problem with the training of how to use a gas mask. And so we uh, contacted Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and gave them a proposal. Uh, the proposal was to come and do a, an experiment uh, using um, huge balloons filled with carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide. Not enough to give you any kind of bad results, but enough so that if you inhaled a little bit of it, it would show up in the blood. And so we would uh, seat a person in a, a hyperbaric room, which was pressure controlled, and the door would close and they'd reduce the pressure so now the door is sealed. And they would have this balloon over the experimentee's head uh, with the experimenter and a safety pin. Uh, the signal for the gas being in the area would be the pop of the balloon. So you didn't have to scream gas. Um, the experimenter would stand behind the person who is being experimented upon and would prick the balloon. The balloon would break. The pop would happen. At that point, the experimenter now is timing how long it takes for that person to put on the mask. We would take a blood sample before and a blood sample after. And we would then compare the two. That difference would give us an idea of how much of an exposure one would have in putting on a gas mask. Now, this didn't take into account uh, individual differences. You might have somebody that's fast, somebody that's slow. The people that you're using in these experiments, were they volunteers? Or? They were volunteers, we think, from Wright-Patterson. And that was a base in? That was in Ohio. In Ohio. That was in Ohio. But they, they see, that was the Air Force base, and they had this chamber, the chamber that could be made airtight. But we developed that 
experiment that experiment in yeah. in our in our unit. Did and I have, have a letter of commendation for that that says thank you very much, Corporal Goldberg, for being a part of this tremendously dangerous uh, experiment. Did you ever think that? Now, there was no nerve gas used in the Korean War, right? Uh, nerve gas, to my knowledge, has never been used. And I certainly hope that it never will be. And um, this is the stuff that uh, is a weapon of mass destruction that um, we looked for and never found. And my suggestion is to our government, if you're looking for these weapons of mass destruction, let's look in our own backyard. Uh, we made this stuff. I don't know for a fact that it was ever destroyed, although there is a lifespan. It does deteriorate uh, over a period of time. It's not easily uh, decontaminated. And um, when I left, they were still working on it in 1955. So um, my uh, words that were given to me when I left the Army was uh, uh, Corporal Goldberg, uh, you do realize that from now on, you no longer are able to read or discuss anything that you've done at secret. Now, this stuff was written by me and <laughs> had my name on it, and I no longer was supposed to be able to read it. I never tried. I never wanted to. I never had need. There were a few things that were published under the uh, Army's uh, guidelines. Um, whatever happened to all that, I, I can't tell you because I left and I left. So my, uh, my experience with the Army was one that was behind the scenes. But I do believe that all of us that were behind the scenes, even though we weren't in jeopardy of being shot at, we were in jeopardy for something else. Certainly. Um, and, and so uh, I consider myself a, a, a veteran of the Korean conflict, even though uh, shortly after I got in, they resolved the conflict, but I still was there. Now, so you're, you're, you're discharged then in, in July of 1955, but because of your, uh, your planning and your uh, education, uh, Perhaps you had you had less difficulty uh, re-entering civilian life than perhaps some other uh, people who served in the Korean uh, conflict at that time. Did you you were were able to get a job easily or? Uh, well, I was able to get a job because there was a need mm -hmm. uh, for educators, educators, teachers, uh, which I started out at. Is and ended up uh, after a few years after that, I went into administration and ended up the school administrator, uh, but. While I was in the uh, service, uh, the Army Chemical Center had um, a laboratory, and the laboratory was doing all the work that I did, in addition to chemists that were doing their work. And we had to have uh, these rats and guinea pigs and various mammals and others. And, and we, did, we did test uh, 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 a, a reptile. I forget which reptile it was. We did have we did have um, the invertebrates uh, as with with I mean the the vertebrates are fish and uh, reptiles and frogs and um, we brought school kids into the Army Chemical Center um, zoo we called it where the animals were being raised and we uh, gave them tours of the uh, of the site nothing that was secret. Just uh, let them hold a hamster, let them pet a mouse, uh, let them have a, a rat nibble on their finger, let them see a monkey, go into the goat pen. And I was asked, because of my training in science as perhaps an educator, to run this program for a while. So it gave me a little bit of experience in what I was going to do later on. Uh, of course, my experience with later on was the high school and we were dealing with elementary kids, but it still gave me an experience, so it was beneficial. Did you uh, did you stay in contact with any of the people you'd met in the service? I did, I did. Um, 
to this day, um, we still exchange Christmas cards uh, with a with a couple, and to this day, I still uh, call uh, now and again uh, one of the guys who was in the service with me. He was in the chemical end. I was in the biological end. Um, because of a um, of a cutback in funds, once again, I'm a victim of a cutback in funds. Uh, they didn't promote me to sergeant when I was supposed to be because my time was ready for that, but they didn't have enough money to pay the people, so we didn't. He got out as a sergeant, so a sergeant hurt, and I uh, still are in contact with each other, but not very many. Did you join a veterans organization or anything like that? Or I did not. I had no need for that. Yeah. How do you, you how do you think your um, service in the military and the experiences you had there? How do you think it affected your life? Oh, did it contribute to any views wow. you had of? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it did. It, it showed me that there's a tremendous amount of incompetence in our government. Uh, it also showed me that there are parts of the government that uh, can work if allowed to, uh, to work without interference from others. Um, it, it, it taught me to be uh, rel reliant upon myself, uh, to try and make decisions without having to ask permission because um, in the Army, my experience was if you started to ask permission, uh, it would get done, but it would get done six or eight months from the time that you wanted it to get done. And so uh, doing it on my own, taking responsibility for what one does uh, was a, a lesson. Because I think I was reading something where one of the, uh, one of the political strategists, I think, for the, um, the Democrats is recommending some kind of um, three months of universal service on the part of everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. So maybe that's... Uh, well, I, I, I think that, you know, you shouldn't do anything for somebody or shouldn't criticize anybody until you walk in their shoes. And to have uh, senators and congressmen of other kinds making decisions to send young people when they've never been at that point is uh, tragic and unconscionable. So I do believe that uh, all of our elected officials should have to have spent time in the service, a documented time, time that has a history to it, and time not pretend time. Uh, I do believe in that, yeah. As I believe that all of our elected officials should probably spend a couple of years in jail before they take office, and that'll teach them what not to do. Is there anything else you think we should add to the to the interview? Uh, uh, well, I, I don't know what the interview intent is. Um, I've given you my my view. One thing that that was very beneficial for me was um, the ability to be able to save the time that was due to me called vacation time. In the Army, it's called leave time. And um, they gave me the opportunity to save that time, work through what you might consider to be a reasonable year and not take any vacation, mm -hmm. and then work through another six months and not take any vacation, no leaves. Oh, we can pass now and again as given, but don't take any leave. So in the end, you have it all accumulated. And you can do with this anything you wanted to do in one lump sum, which I did as a 36-day uh, leave to Europe. So well, I was able to hitchhike with the government uh, vehicles. I went to a, uh, an Army naval air base and was able to hitchhike uh, with a friend who was also in my unit uh, to Europe. So it cost me nothing. All I had to do was show transportation back, 
which I did by buying a, a, a ticket on a, on a ship sailing home, the uh, US or the SS Liberté, which is a French line ship. So I got there free and paid for my way back. And this was before July 21st of This 55? was July, before of July 21 of 1955, 36 days or 38 days before that, more or less, uh, maybe 40 days. Uh, I was able to go um, in uniform to uh, Italy, where I took off the uniform and put on civilian clothes and uh, traveled on my own as a civilian. Uh, if I needed to, I put on the uniform again and go to any base and have the uh, facility there uh, to my need, which, which I didn't have. So the Army did give me a, uh, a benefit there where they let me uh, save my time and use it however I wanted to. Um, and we had a lot of folks in the Army Chemical Center who did that. Of course, we were at a different educational level and knew how to play the game. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, <clears throat> that you were able to call upon your Army experience to your advantage uh, when you were recently in New York. Is that right? Oh, yes. Yes, I was in New York and wanted to go to, um, uh, to West Point. Never been there. And we were in the area, and this was after 9-11. And so we went up to the gate, and they very politely said, you are not welcome here, as anyone is not welcome here, unless you have official business, because we are very, very concerned about security. And we understood that and bought it. And then I said, you know, let me try something. And I carry with me a certificate of service of the Armed Forces of the United States, which has my name and my rank, and it has also my dates of service. And I, I carry this, I don't know why, I just do. So I said, excuse me, uh, sir, to the guards at the gate. I said, I, uh, I, I'm a veteran uh, of the United States our military, and I wonder if this card would allow me any kind of a privilege to come in. And he takes the card and looks at it and says, excuse me, and goes to what looks to be a higher authority, and they chat with their rifles in their hand, and he comes back and says, uh, sir, called me sir, of course I was older, so I guess I could be called sir. Um, we think that you might be able to go on a tour on your own, providing you stay on the main roads. And uh, if you will give me your word that you will stay on the main roads and just see you know, what's going on and not enter any of the buildings, I think we can allow this. I said, thank you very much, and we will. And then in closing, he said, and sir, if anybody asked you why you're here, Tell them you're going to see the dentist. <laughs> anyway, my card uh, that I carried for all these years and probably never saw the light of day until that time at West Point <laughs> is now beneficial. So I guess I'll just keep it. Mr. Goldberg, thank you for a very uh, interesting uh interview and it's uh, it's about a subject that nobody has touched upon at all in uh, any of the 19 interviews we've done to date and uh, I think some of our uh, our students and uh, interested patrons will find that um, very intriguing uh, and I'm going to go and try and find that article in Look Magazine. <laughs> it probably is uh, 1953 maybe November, uh, but it, we didn't know whether or not to stamp it secret, which was our joke. Well, this interview will not be secret, so. No, no. <laughs> it's okay, no. I guess. Uh, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this. I hope that uh, people will learn, and uh, my closing comment is, we always thought that our two years was lost in our life. And in looking back, I really only can remember the nice things. 
I'm sure there were a lot of bad things that I moaned about, but uh, I don't think I can remember those as compared to the number of, of, of good experiences that I had with this uh, uh, two years that I spent in the service. Uh, I didn't make a lot of money, uh, and I did get an insurance policy that I have to this day. But other than that, uh, I'm considered to be a veteran, and I'm proud of it. Thank you. You're welcome.